thanks for the introduction, Mark. Um, thanks, uh, guys, for the invitation. It's great to be here. It's such an impressive turnout on a beautiful Saturday. And it's also great to be uh, in Dallas and, and part of the um, Dallas medical community and look forward to getting to know many of you perhaps over the, the many, many years. Um, Manos and, and friends have asked me to talk about um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and, and sort of novel therapies. And it's been really a research and interest of mine for almost the last uh, 20 years, since 93, 94 or so. And what I'd like to do is sort of just have you sit back and just let me tell you this 20-year story of, of what's really transpired in the field of uh, evaluating diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It's certainly hard to do that in the next 20 minutes, but I think two slides will sort of um, highlight where we've been, and I think the response to these next two slides will likely predict where we'll go uh, for at least the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and there's been major blockbuster failures of, of medications to treat diabetes, hyperglycemia, and maybe even combined lipid disorders. And these drugs have been identified to perhaps be uh, unsafe from a cardiovascular perspective. And so how can that happen? How, do, how are drugs approved? And how can we use them in millions and millions of people and sort of not know what the hazard ratio might be um, with respect to non-fatal MI? So we've had epic failures. Uh, so that sets the stage. And, and Avandia might be sort of the biggest, highest profile fa failure to date. But there's been others. Um, but this slide, I think, sets the background of what's at stake. So we've had failures, but are the failures important or not important? Well, it's pretty important because uh, about 10% of the adult U.S. population has diabetes. 350 people worldwide have um, diabetes. There's no question that there's an increasing awareness about the link between diabetes and heart disease. And then largely before the last uh, few years, there were just a handful of drugs to use to treat diabetes. So there's a lot of new medications. In fact, 12 new classes are being currently evaluated for the safety and efficacy of diabetes. So there's a lot of drugs, and patients are at risk. The other question we don't know the answer to is if you lower A1C, what does that mean for the patient? Certainly, it means a reduction in microvascular complications, retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, but does that translate into a reduction in macrovascular complications? And I think that question is probably, I say probably, probably been answered. At least we have brackets around what it potentially means, and I'll share that data with you very briefly. Now, if you don't follow the literature, you may have missed this publication, but perhaps we've plateaued with the flattening of the uh, prevalence and incidence of uh, type 2 diabetes. So we'll be very curious to follow us over the next few years to see if this is a one major blip and we're back, uh, you know, off to the racetrack or if we really are going to flatten at um, the current prevalence rates. And, and I'm not sure with the increasing trends in obesity and type 2 diabetes in the young, I'm not convinced this will be a sustainable plateau. Um, but that's the data. This is a complex slide, but I'd like to just say two things about it. First off, if you have diabetes, and if you're a man or a woman, your likelihood to survive is left. Your line is left of the right line, which means that at any given age, you're more likely to die. And you're more likely to die of a lot of things, um, but you're more likely to die if you have diabetes or not diabetes. And that's true in the statin era, the aspirin era. I mean, no matter what era we're in, no matter what thing we seem to drive down, the risk of death and cardiovascular death is higher if you have type 2 diabetes. The other um, slide er, image is this one. This black, if you will, is cardiovascular death. So if you just look at the area under the curve, at least half of mortal events are related to cardiovascular causes. This is probably a conservative estimate. Um, it's also true that people with diabetes are more likely to have cancer, non-cancer, non-vascular death. So they die of a lot of things. The issue is, is that 70% of the people with uh, diabetes have cardiovascular death. So, you know, if you back up, cardiovascular death is still the number one cause of death. But that means different things for people, those of us with diabetes and those of us without diabetes. If you don't have diabetes, about 30% of all cause mortality is related to cardiovascular death. So a 30-70 rule. If you have diabetes, it's 70-30. These numbers have changed a little bit. It's a little outdated, but it's not terribly outdated. It's almost a two-fold increase in cardiovascular mortality for people with diabetes. So cardiologists, well, we're cardiologists. We don't do diabetes. It's not that important. We don't see it that often. Well, we do. Sometimes we don't recognize we see it. Sometimes in the cath lab, we don't know people have diabetes. But in the NERMI registry, the, the frequency is well above 30%. In the NCDR, it's gone from about 12, 15, 16%, which is the cath PCI registry, now north of uh, 20, close to 
um, it will continue to rise. Uh, there's no question that there's a lot of what I call occult diabetes, meaning that people come in, they have overt hyperglycemia, and we don't really pick up on it. We don't make the diagnosis. So I think about 7 to 10% of our population is probably undiagnosed in, on the medical wards, um, in, in cardiology at least. So it's prevalent, um, for sure. Now this, um, I wrote some time ago, but I still sort of believe it. Um, there remains an unyielding incremental CV risk for patients with type 2 diabetes. And that, what I think that means, what it means to me is that there's no question, if you look at survival curves over time, we're improving survival. I mean, you know, mortality rates are going down, non-fatal MI rates are going down. So if you look at trends over time, they're going down. And they're going down for people with diabetes and without diabetes. But if you look at the delta, the relative risk between the two, it still is about two to four-fold difference. So to me, it means that there's sort of unmet biological plausibility, unmet need in the field of diabetes um, that we have yet to sort of resolve. So, and I think this is um, really driven by a couple of things. You know, people say that, often say that there's a two-fold increased risk um, for death MI stroke, but one of the, the principal drivers, I think, of morbidity and heart failure is the non-fatal myocardial infarction rate in people with diabetes, and it's where I've spent some time in, in clinical interest, uh, to be sure. So, this, there was a series of clinical trials that have now all been published and reported um, trying to answer the question, is type glycemic control associated with improved CV outcomes in people with type 2 diabetes? And by type glycemic control, it means different things to different clinical investigators. Uh, it, it could be as low as A1C of 6 or 6.5 in some trials, but 7 to 7.5 is a reasonable uh, target. So caustic rate in all of those trials, frankly, um, were negative. I mean, no single trial showed a reduction. I'm going to share a meta-analysis with you. But people thought this for a number of reasons, and they thought it um, from one of the original UK PDS studies, where if you lowered the A1C, it was associated with about a 16% relative risk reduction for myocardial infarctions. This is relative risk. And just remember that 16% number, because it comes up again in the medical literature um, with non-fatal MI rate. And there were a number of observational studies that associated A1C and, and, and MI. So the working hypothesis, of course, was if you lower A1C, you lower MI, and everyone is sort of a win. And that didn't translate in the individual clinical trials. There have been several meta-analyses um, that have been done in the field, and I think sort of the best one, uh, at least the one that got the most traction, was Kasich Gray's meta-analysis in Lancet. He included five trials, UKPDS, Proactive, Advanced, VADT, and Accord. For those of you that are sort of diabetes, cardiovascular experts, I'm not sure Proactive is a, a type glycemic control trial, but he included it and made very little difference um, if you exclude it. Um, 33,000 patients, they looked at um, a typical MACE, sort of all-cause mortality, non-fatal MI stroke, and then looked at a fatal and non-fatal MI and stroke. And, and I won't show the entire um, trial results, but I will show you two forest plots. The first is mortality. You know, there was a lot of controversy about Accord. This remember the Accord trial where people were driving down, diabetologists were just flogging patients to drive down glucose, drive down glucose, and really to hit very low A1C rates, relatively high risk cohort. And the more, there was an increased mortality signal in this. Fascinating story, probably had nothing to do with hypoglycemia, but, um, but you saw heterogeneity in the outcomes of these trials. But if you pooled the analysis, there was really no signal either a benefit or risk for mortality in tight glycemic control. So it was neutral if you, if you pool all the trials. The thing that is, I think, true and consistent, if you look at this meta-analysis and a couple of others and think of UK PDS and look at non-fatal MI, there was a 17% relative risk reduction for non-fatal MI. Um, so there was a modest, significant reduction in non-fatal MI with tight glycemic control. Given the absolute risk, one would expect sort of a little bit bigger event reductions. It's a really modest effect size given the background risk of, of, this, um, of this population. So somewhat, I mean, for sure disappointing with respect to tight glycemic control. Many sort of in the field didn't sort of buy on, into this concept. So then it becomes a really important question, right? If we're using drugs that don't lower CV risk, and we're just lowering glucose and maybe driving down other endpoints, clinically meaningful endpoints, you know, blindness, kidney failure. Is there an off-target signal or are there safety concerns with the drugs we're using? So with the 
publication of the many trials, it became a real issue for the FDA. And, and I'm going to just show you a couple of examples of, of, of studies that have proven not to be safe. I mean, you, um, the university group UGDP in the 70s demonstrated that tobutamide was not safe. And rather than taking it off the market, you know, there was a black box warning. And that signal for, for cardiovascular mortality was, was substantial. If you look at um, a sort of more modern day analysis, this comes from a Danish group and it's a registry analysis. And, and the point is really um, straightforward. If you use metformin as the benchmark, every other, um, almost every other uh, oral hypoglycemic agent, at least insulin secreted uh, GOGs, there was an increased associative cardiovascular mortality relative to metformin. Limited for sure, non-randomized, measured confounder, unconfounder, but yet consistent evidence that perhaps metformin might be safer than the other agents um, available. So at least what it told me was there is possibly heterogeneity in the drugs and the drug classes we use to treat an at-risk um, population. So the really the story really begins with this single meta-analysis, and I want to. Just share this with you, not not because a movie will probably be made about it or you know people lost billions, but it, it really speaks to, I think everyone in the room that cares for patients and runs clinical trials and has a policy um, uh, opinion, and that is how poorly we understood the outcomes of people on TZDs, and, and I'll just show you the data that Nissen used to perform this meta analysis. Um, there were 42 trials. And in, in the FDA allowed drugs to be approved for use after 26 weeks of treatment with only showing a reduction in A1C. I mean, so you had to only show that it lowered glucose and that you didn't see signals after about 26 weeks. So the, the benchmark was pretty low relative to what we're accustomed to in, in, in sort of the cardiology field or the heart failure arena. Um, death or MI was the outcome, 42 trials. Uh, um, there were 116 trials that were screened. Um, this is a little, sort of right. I'll get into how many non-fatal myocardial infarctions there were, there were in a minute. But he, right here, 86 in the rosy glitazone group, 72 in the control group, with a um, odds ratio of 1.43, p-value of 0.03. You know, and these, these are from these trials, small studies, um, and these numbers are what this was what made the whole field a difference of 14 myocardial infarctions. I mean, if you were a CEO of a pharmaceutical company and you thought your billion dollar drug was going to deliver dime 14 MIs, you would have designed an appropriate clinical trial so you would be certain about it. We'll, I don't think we will ever go back to this, whether the FDA sort of mandates or doesn't mandate it. You just won't want the uncertainty of a delta of 14 myocardial infarctions. So uh, Nissen's was the first. Um, and then Mike Linkoff did an interesting study where he used the pyoglitazone trials and demonstrated a benefit. So you have Rosie demonstrating a risk. PIO demonstrating a benefit. So now you have two drugs in the same class with bidirectional outcomes. And so that caused a bit of a controversy, right? Because the, the outcomes were uh, bidirectional. Then the, the Medicare beneficiary analysis, I think, sort of sealed it for me. Um, this is a meta analysis looking at a rosy glitazone versus PIO glitazone um, and showed that, in fact, there was an increased risk associated with ROSI versus PIO if you looked at a composite endpoint. Now, the AMI rate uh, was similar, but if you combine death MI, stroke, and heart failure, you found um, a risk with ROSI versus PIO. So what happened is history, right? With the publication of that and the FDA requiring uh, restrictions for the use of that agent, you know, really a difference of 14 events drove down the use of ROSI glitazone substantially. And, and now they've lessened some of the restrictions, but I don't think it will ever go back to where it was. And maybe, it, and that's the right answer, maybe it shouldn't given the, given the data. So in the next few minutes, where are we now and where are we going? This is a four, no, this is a 4.2 page document, four pages from the FDA, and it transformed the way drugs are approved in the United States overnight. And it's the 2008 guidance for how diabetes drugs can be approved in the United States. And it's quite simply that you need to rule out two margins of risk. And for time's sake, I won't go through it. I have a detailed force plot and I'll haze over it, but it comes down to two numbers. If your upper bound is less than 1.8, but greater than 1.3, you have to do a post-approval clinical trial. And usually it's gonna have to about two, yeah, two or 300 endpoints um, for that trial to prove that, and then 600 to prove if it's less than 1.3. If you're less than 1.3, you're approved. No drug except for one has been approved 
um, right off the bat with a lesson 1.3, although that I think will change. I drew this just to show you the difference. This is a cardiovascular outcome trial. This is where we all live. 99% follow-up, five years. You know, this area under the curve is substantial. This is the diabetes trials before 2008. There was just so little endpoint data, you couldn't be confident about uh, what was happening. And I'm not going to go through this, but this is, you know, the diabetes companies live or die by these four or five scenarios on what their clinical trial is going to show and could spend hours talking about estimates for that. But maybe you aren't aware of this. There are just about, maybe more, diabetes drugs now, classes of drugs, and there are hypertension drugs. So the time is here where there are a lot of choices to treat diabetes, and I actually think this will increase substantially over the next few years if you think about how many companies are, are investing in this space right now. I'm going to present just three trials, and I'm going to spend just a minute or two on each one. It, it was really largely debated whether insulin was you know, good or bad. I mean, you go to the diabetes debates, is insulin you know, bad for heart disease? Is it not bad? I mean, the origin is a long-acting agent, but really is a huge clinical trial. 15,000 patients screened, 12,000 patients randomized, long-acting insulin glargine to placebo. N no difference, right? I mean, there's just no signal for insulin treatment versus no insulin treatment in, in origin. So I think this is largely, at least for long-acting insulin, has been put to rest. Whether or not you can generalize that to shorter-acting insulins, I'll leave it to the diabetologists among us. Um, to discuss. The incretin um, axis is worth knowing about in the field of cardiology. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time other than talk about the on-target and off-target effects and then just give the results of a couple clinical trials that have been published. There will be many, many more um, coming in the future. But GLP-1, native GLP-1, is a gut uh, hormone and it affects a number of organs. The pancreas, it, it uh, increases insulin secretion, um, glucagon secretion causes vasodilation. It has uh, very active, it's very active in the brain to decrease food intake. Um, and there's now um, a high dose loraglutide that's been approved for use in the United States for obesity treatment. Um, so the same class of drugs at higher doses will be approved to manage um, being overweight and diabetes uh, in, in both non-diabetic and diabetic patients. So there's a number of effects, and there's ways to modulate this. You can add DPP-4 inhibitors because DPP-4 degrades GLP-1, or you can modify GLP-1 to make it a long-acting agent and, and use injectables. And so there are several of these agents. Um, the ones you've probably heard about are citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin uh, for the DPP-4 inhibitors, and then exenatide and loraglutide for the incretin mimetics or the injectables. And these two have published in clinical trials um, as required by, by the FDA. And so I'll just very briefly go over the examine um, and SAVER clinical trials uh, very briefly. So uh, uh, SAVER was published in the New England Journal of Medicine just last year, type 2 diabetes. They, they were at risk for heart disease, quite a simple design, placebo versus saxagliptin-5. And, and this is the primary endpoint in, in, this, in the field. There have been expanded MACE endpoints over time with unstable angina revascularization, but People have really withdrawn from that as, as an endpoint. It's a CV death, MI, and stroke. And like origin, I mean, you couldn't differentiate the two, right? I mean, there's just no difference. There's no efficacy, fair, but there's no risk. There's certainly no risk, at least that what we possibly saw in the TZD story um, here. And I mean, these lines are super imposable. The one thing that was a surprise, and that I'm sure we'll be talking about for a long time, is that hospitalization for heart failure was significantly higher and the saxagliptin um, versus the placebo. I mean, low numbers, uh, but it came out as significant. Nobody was really expecting it. Adjudication wasn't, you know, proscriptive and prescribed. Um, and some of the clinical trials we're doing now, we are adjudicating heart failures who may have a better um, idea of, of what this signal may or may not mean. You can take allogliptin, which is a little bit different study. Um, it's a post-ACS study um, for secondary prevention, people with type 2 diabetes. Um, but, but for the ACS indication and the drug, the, the trials were really, really very similar. Um, patients had, uh, were admitted with ACS within 15 nine to 90 days of randomization. They excluded really high-risk, unstable patients, so it's said to be relatively stable ACS patients. And again, I mean, these are huge trials. These trials probably cost $300 million, maybe a little bit less to run. Neutral, no signal. Um, and no efficacy for the two, and it met its inferiority margin of, of 1.3. So where is um, the heart failure story? Remember the TZDs were associated with heart failure 
um, peripheral edema. And a lot of people in the room have done a lot of work um, on, on elucidating heart failure and TZDs. But I put this slide up just to sort of benchmark um, what we're seeing in the DPP-4 story. So the background heart failure incidence is a little bit lower in these trials, but and the relative risk would, uh, risk is slightly different. But you saw it in both SABER and examine. Um, don't know what it means. Um, the, the VIVID trial, which is another oral DPP-4, didn't show it and it presented ADA. There was no signal, but it's very low risk um, in like 10 versus 8. So it was a 25% relative risk reduction, but the, the number of events was very low. I'll end with this slide because there, there are now over 200,000 patients in diabetes and cardiovascular outcome trials. So there is a lot of money and effort being spent on these clinical trials. And it's, I suspect that many or most will be neutral. Uh, it's hard to know for sure. You know, if you just look at the problem the medical community is going to have is that if you look at these, there are well over 20, 25 trials, right? So one of these trials might show superiority, right? And so if a trial or a drug shows superiority, what is that going to mean in the context of diabetes? So I'm waiting for that trial to come out. Um, and because I'm not sure how we'll interpret it. If it's one of our trials, it'll be true. <laughs> but, but anybody else's probably just a false positive. But, um, you know, so I don't really know. There's just so many going on. I just don't know what we'll do with the positive trial. But that's what the field right now. And this, this has actually grown since I made this slide um, six months ago. So to, to summarize, um, you know, people with diabetes, you know, diabetes is common. It's plateaued. There's an increased relative risk, to be sure. We haven't solved... Um, the risk in people with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, whether there's separate biology driving it, I'm not certain. Um, the FDA has set the benchmark, um, and it, this is spilled over into obesity uh, drugs as well. You now have to approve CV safety for obesity drugs. I suspect this will go on for a period of time, but I can't imagine that it will look exactly the way it looks now if every one of these trials is neutral or negative, because these trials are phenomenally expensive, and you'd be nice to divert resources um, to other places. So uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to end and, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, look forward to next year's meeting, too.